last week we were dealing with Janus space. And this week is a continuation, but not on Janus space. The topic today is whatever happens, whatever you do, hold on to hope. Whatever happens, whatever you do, hold on to hope. It is said when hope is gone, nothing remains. Everything is gone. In the passage at hand, we have a very heartbreaking story. It's not one of those stories that you would enjoy reading. As opposed to the last week one, the last week one was quite an interesting one to read. But this week, the passage is so heartbreaking because it speaks of situations that were just too extreme. When hope is gone in life, nothing else remains. Statistics by the World Health Organization show that 800,000 people every year end their lives by way of suicide. 800,000, that is from World Health Organization. And this translates to one person committing suicide every 40 seconds. So you can calculate by the time I've done with 40, uh, 35 minutes of my preaching, how many people will have committed suicide. In fact, 800,000 translated to how many uh, commit suicide daily, that translates to 2,191 people, 0.7. I mean 0.7, I think 0.7 of a person is somebody who attempted suicide but is 70% dead. He must be in ICU right now. That's shocking. That's shocking. And what drives people to commit suicide? At some point in life, hope is gone. There must be a situation that pushed them to a hopeless situation and they decided to end their lives. When hope is gone, a hopeless person, and Biliki has a mezeki. Whatever you tell, they don't listen, because hope is gone. And last week we also mentioned that Satan never uses fair means to win the game. He uses very, very unfair approaches. And he waits for you when you are in your lowest moments. He hits and hits hard. Because he never uses a fair way to win the game. The passage at hand tells a story of a situation that was so difficult. It is interesting to note that Israelites, who are God's people, loved God, followed his commands, they had seen God work in their lives and the lives of others, not just those who love them, but also their enemies, and they knew the Lord. They knew what God would do. But sometimes down the road, they would lose hope and turn their backs on God. And God would respond by punishing them so severely. And he would use sometimes heathen men, men and women, who did not love the Lord punish them and to bring them back to him. Last week we concluded the passage with these words. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. That was an interesting way to conclude. They stopped raiding Israel's territory. But when we open today's passage, you notice something else. Kumba, they didn't stop. After some years, they revisited their bad manners. Bad manners hardly die. You know, sometimes they can be revisited. And so after many years, they revisited. And it begins by saying, sometime later. This sometime could be many, many years later. The king of uh, Aram, Ben Hadad, went back to Samaria. And they say, you know, we still remember what you did to us. So they had not forgotten. 
And so God is using Ben Hadad, who is an ungodly man, ungodly king, to punish the Israelites because they had turned their backs on God. They had followed after other gods. And so Ben Hadad visits Samaria and he visits at that time that you don't want to be visited. The lowest moment. There was famine in the land. And there being famine in the land, normally supply of food goes down. And so inflation comes in. And the city is depending on food supplies from the neighboring cities and even the countryside. And King Ben-Hadad of Aram knows that all the supplies that go to Samaria pass this route. And so for me to push them into submission, I have to cut their supplies. And this was a normal practice in war. It has happened across years. That you lay siege and you starve people to submission. And so they laid siege in the city of Samaria. In fact, it, history narrates that the soldiers that had gone round the city were shoulder to shoulder during the day, standing shoulder to shoulder. So there was no way to escape. And at night they would light campfire that was like a long ring that was surrounding the city. So during the day there is no escape. During the night, there is no escape. And the siege went on for many days. And what happens during this time? Every time when there is a crisis of supply, the supply and demand curves will dictate the market. And so there is no food. And the little food that is available becomes so expensive to get. And you listen to what the passage says, that how severe the situation was. The, severe, the situation was so severe that, verse 25, there was so great famine. There was a great famine in the city, and the siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. Why a donkey's head? Why is the writer mentioning a donkey's head? Because the context that we are talking about, these are Israelites. A donkey fell in the category of the unclean animals when you read in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 11. It was not in the category of those animals that you would take for sacrifice. And every time an animal gave birth to his first uh, firstling, you were supposed to give that one to the Lord. It was supposed to be sacrificed to the Lord. But in case of a donkey, you are not supposed to sacrifice because it was in the category of the unclean animals. You are supposed to redeem it. And you redeem it so that another clean animal can be sacrificed. And the rate of redeeming a donkey at that time was 20 shekels. And this is not just the head of a donkey. This is a whole donkey walking you redeem it for 20 shekels. Now the siege has lasted so bad and the situation is so bad that the head of a donkey, for you to go and make your nice soup from this unclean animal in this context, the head alone was going for 80 shekels. And not just the head of a donkey. It goes on to say that uh, a quarter of a cup of seed board for five shekels. The way the Kiswahili Bible puts it is quite interesting. Go read it in Kiswahili. I'll not quote it. Go read it. I mean, it puts it so graphically. And that was explained, that's just to explain how bad the situation was. And at this time, the siege is going on. Ben Haddad is not coming because he had an experience with his soldiers. We saw it last week. He knows if I go there, they may do to me what they did last time and even worse. 
So we will just cut supply and we'll stay far from them. And what happens? When the people are pushed to the wall, they will come out with extreme mechanism for survival. And so the food is gone. The little one that is available is to be taken care of so seriously. And now the people come up with solution to their problem. And some of the solutions are so heartbreaking to take care of their survival. Two ladies in the story come up with a deal. And these two ladies each had a son. They say, if we don't come up with a solution, we are going to die. And the solution number one that you are going to deal with is with the children. Quite heartbreaking situation. And they say, you donate your son, we condemn it to the cooking pot for tonight, so that tomorrow we condemn mine to make the ends meet. That's how tough the situation was. And they agreed, they sealed the deal. One honors the deal, another one pulls out of the deal halfway. After she had eaten, the other lady's son, down the road when it was her turn, she hides the son. She says, I don't know. Maybe she's playing outside. Let's go looking for him. He has disappeared. And this was so painful to the other lady. And whom does she report to? The situation is so bad, the system is down, and she sees the king walking. And the king is equally devastated. And she voices her concern to the king. This happens every time. Even in our country, when people are going through extreme situations, you've seen in situations where somebody speaks to His Excellency the President in the crowd that I have an issue, Mr. President, can you help me out? That is, you are between a rock and a hard place. You can, you just seek for solution where it can be found. And so one of the ladies voices her concern to the king. And he says, king, please help me. And listen to the reply. The reply. In verse 26 he says, help me, my lord, the king. And listen to what the king, the response from the king. The king replied, if the Lord does not help you, I mean, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press, then what is your problem? The king is equally devastated. He knows that maybe this lady wants to tell me I slept without food. I mean, it's everywhere. And the king is saying, where do you want me to get help from? The situation is equally bad for all of us. Why are you turning to me? Where do you want me to get help from? And what is your issue? And the lady gives an issue. That we agreed, we struck a deal with this lady that we were going to slaughter her son, uh, my son for dinner and we did it yesterday. Now it is her turn today and she is saying we are going to sleep without food. And she is telling it to a king who is equally devastated. And what does the king do? He does the unthinkable. He abandons the Lord. And not just abandoning the Lord, he turns his back on the Lord and he also turns his back on his servant, Elisha. Remember, Elisha is the same guy the king was telling him last week that shall I kill him, my father? Shall I kill him? They were in good working relationship. This time, because of the concerns of the ladies, she turns, he turns and says, it must be that this prophet is not praying enough to God to have this situation come to an end. And instead of addressing the lady's plight, he turns to the prophet and he makes a vow. He says these words. And he says, may the Lord, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains in his shoulders today. He says, this man has a solution, but he's not going to give me. Now his head will be in my paperback by the end of today. 
whatever happens, please do not lose hope. When hope is gone, nothing remains. And church, this story brings to our attention situations that sometimes we go through in life. Sometimes we are pushed to the corner by situations and affairs and concerns of this life to the point that we think that we have no hope. And sometimes we can come up with solutions that are so devastating. This afternoon, I'm reminding us, as I remind myself also, that whatever happens, please do not lose hope. The Lord is still on the throne and is forever in charge of all the situations. Allow me to draw some three lessons for our reflection from this passage today. Lesson number one, on why we should not lose hope. Lesson number one, when hope is gone, you can consume your tomorrow today. The dangers of losing hope, when hope is gone, you can consume your tomorrow today. What that means is that, what I always say, you can provide permanent solutions to temporary problems. When somebody commits suicide, that is so final. That is so final. To a situation that could have been solved. In the passage, we find this heartbreaking story the babies whose future was so promising, full of life, full of hope, their lives were cut short because of a hopeless situation. When hope is gone, you can consume your tomorrow today. In fact, the babies, the Bible mentions that they were sons. And the context which we, the passage is written in is a Jewish context. This was a society that valued the male child so much that if you read in the Bible, a male child was so desired to the point that some people would do, for lack of a better word, stupid stuff to get a male child. A simple example is Abraham. Abraham went to an extent of going out with his house girl, just to have a son. Because a male child was so desired. Think of the story of Hannah. Hannah prayed to God, even with strong intercession, and she was saying, give me a son. And God honored. The son was so valued by the context. But here, because of hopelessness, Ladies who have lost hope, they were ready to condemn their future. It drove these ladies to kill the child. And this was quite unfortunate. When hope is gone, you can consume your tomorrow today. We live in a society where we have countless examples of men and women who love the Lord. But when challenging situations come their way, they lose hope. And they want to fix things their own ways. They do things that will have repercussions on their health. That will cost them their health, will cost them their money, will cost them their time, will cost them heartbreaks later. Because hope is gone. Whatever happens, church, never lose hope. I mean, if I wish these ladies would still hold on, because in the near, in the next passage, you'll find that the situation turned, not long after that time. But they wouldn't sustain to wait for that time. When hope is gone, you can consume your tomorrow today. Think of moments in life when situations became so tough and you made wrong decisions because you had no otherwise according to you, that there was no way I could get out of this situation. A lady in one of the universities went through a situation 
that always happens. It's nothing new. It happens every time. She was left by the boy boyfriend. And the pain was just too much. It was just too much. I mean too much. And the young girl went and bought some painkillers because the pain is just too much. And she took not one, not two, not three, but 14, 15 painkillers to ease the pain. She's still waiting for resurrection as we are talking today. Hopelessness, lack of hope. When hope is gone, you can consume your future today. You can consume your tomorrow today. In this passage, because hope was gone, the ladies were ready and willing to cook their own children for a situation that would soon end. Are you in any situation that is seemingly difficult? Brothers and sisters, members of ACML, my friends, do not lose hope. The Lord is still on the throne. Stay put. If the situation is too painful, talk to somebody. You can't manage it alone. Talk to somebody. But don't lose hope. The Lord is still on the throne. Lesson number two that we find from this passage. When hope is gone, you can consume someone else tomorrow. When hope is gone, you can consume somebody else tomorrow. Hopelessness not only brings us to a situation where we are willing to consume our own future, but it also takes us even further to a situation where we are with, ready and willing to consume the future of those around us. The lady is out of hopelessness. Hope was gone. Condemn the future of their children. The future of the young children that was promising ahead of them was condemned by some hopeless characters. When hope is gone, you can consume someone else's future. Think of moments in life where because we have lost hope, we say things with no regard for their long-term impact on others. Situations that push us to a, a corner where we speak words that would later on have repercussion to the future of others around us. Think of situations where out of hopelessness, we take actions with no regard to the devastation it will produce in the lives of those around us. Imagine of couples killing each other and leaving young children behind, devastated beyond words. Just because they could not solve their differences, they decide to end their lives and frustrate the lives of young, promising children. I wish these ladies would have said, because we are so hopeless, let's deal with our own lives and let the children live. But they decided to condemn the future of the children because they lost hope. Think of young people who kill because the relationship has gone sour. They leave families that had invested on them devastated beyond words because of hopelessness. A young man is left by a lady and you think the world has come to an end. The world is not ending soon. There is a future ahead. And they leave families devastated beyond words. Very sad. The examples are countless. You see them in the local dailies and even in our news every time. Young men, brothers and sisters who are in relationships, ukiachwa achika. I'm talking to you as your pastor, ukiachwa achika. I mean ukiachwa achika. Don't kill somebody else's future. Don't go buying a shocker. Don't lose hope. The Lord is still on the throne. 
God is not dead. Mungu hajakufa na hakufi. There is still a future. When you lose hope, you can destroy somebody else's future. And this is very sad. In this passage, out of hopeless situation, children with promising futures life were at risk because hope was gone. I think of couples who divorce or who seek divorce because of some selfish interest, not thinking of the long-term psychological and emotional impact their divorce has on their children. Because of your interest, selfish interest, you say we are parting. You forget the future of others who are, that is at stake. My friends, it will come back to you. It will be bigger, it will be better. You think it's just a game that's going to end soon, it will come back to you. The ladies in this passage condemned the future of the young children because they were hopeless. You may think that was their story. It comes back home. When we are faced with tough situations, please, please, do not lose hope. Hold on. The Lord is still there on the throne. Think of children who are born and dumped into the toilets because you think I am not ready to be called Baba so-and-so or Mama so-and-so. You destroy their future because of hopelessness. Stories were in the news of the many that are buried in Nairobi River. Very heartbreaking stories because of hopelessness. Brothers and sisters, let us not lose hope. When situations get tough, let us not lose hope. Because when we lose hope, we will also destroy the future of others. And when you get to that situation, please talk to somebody. Please talk to somebody. The Church of Christ is still open to all of us. Give a call. Give me a call. Give a call to Pastor Minyambo. Give a call to somebody. Say I'm between a rock and a hard place. Talk to somebody. Don't die. Don't condemn the future of others because of hopelessness. Whatever you do, please hold on to hope. Do not lose hope. Lesson number three and the final one. When hope is gone, you can do the unthinkable. I mean, how could I fix this one? You can just do the unthinkable. What is this unthinkable thing? Think of that what is unthinkable. You can do that when hope is gone. Think of mothers cooking their own children for food. I mean, how can you think about that? Parents here can, can just imagine the devastation of that situation. Think of parents, mothers. If, if, if it were fathers, it would be something else. Because sometimes the ladies say, but these are mothers. Mothers condemning their children to the cooking pot. For soup, I mean. When hope is gone, you can do the unthinkable. And not just the mothers alone who did the unthinkable. Even the king himself. When the ladies took this, their case to the king, whom they expected that he will be sober enough to give a solution to the problem, they find a hopeless character in the name of a king. And what does the king do? He says, I'm fed up with God. I give up, I give up, I give up. Fed up with God. Because of hopelessness. And in his anger, he sends for someone to go and kill, kill God's chosen servant, Elisha. Whom, in the next chapter, you will notice that it is this same Elisha whom the king wants to kill is the same guy whom God sends with a message that this is coming to an end, the city is coming to an end. If the king had killed Elisha who is coming with a message of hope, the situation would have worsened. When you get to that hopeless situation, and you want to take a step. Take a step back. Talk to somebody. You can do the unthinkable. Say that where I am right now, I'm not in my 
soberness, sober mind. Please let somebody else take over from here. Talk to somebody. The challenges that we have as a nation and even as individuals or families is because people get to situations where hope is gone. And when hope is gone, they are not ready to take the next step of talking to somebody about their challenges. And they take steps from their hopeless minds, out of their hopeless minds. Hopelessness is dangerous. In the New Testament, beat out of hopelessness, say to the other disciples, now that Christ is gone, I go back fishing. I mean, I still have my tools of trade, I go back fishing. Hopeless situation. Hope was gone. Peter, when Jesus was being arrested, out of hopelessness situation, he chopped off a soldier's ear. Out of when hope is gone, we can do things that are unthinkable. And Christ tells him, stop that. Out of hopelessness, Saul of Tarsus persecuted the church of Christ and even witnessed the stoning of Stephen to death. When hope is gone, we can do the unthinkable. Out when hope is gone, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for 30 bob. Very sad situation. When hope is gone, we can be pushed to doing what is unthinkable. And we should not get to that point. I read in a local dailies one time of a lady who had issues with her husband. And the lady was seriously expectant. I mean seriously expectant. You know what I mean. And there were myths around that the ladies had told her, you know when you expect that your husband cannot beat you up, cannot touch you. And so the lady went home with the same myth. And Kumbesh is dealing with a hopeless character. And the lady says to the man, I'm telling to a hopeless character. What the guy did is just unthinkable kicked the lady 32 times and went to the house, came with a well-sharpened panga and chopped her to many pieces. She's waiting for resurrection. Hopeless situation when hope is gone, we can do the unthinkable. God in this passage today is reminding us as a church and as an individual that whatever happens to you, do not lose hope. Hold on to hope. The Lord is still on the throne. May the Lord bless us.